Hello, my name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our friends at ACPNY for hosting today's session on perioperative antithrombotic management with Dr. Lohr. Dr. Robert Lohr received his BA and MD degrees from Northwestern University in Chicago and completed his residency in internal medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dr. Lohr has had a robust career serving as chief resident, uh, chair of the Department of Medicine, and then the section head for regional practice at the Mayo Clinic. And now he volunteers with the MAVEN Project. Dr. Lohr, when you are ready. All right, thank you and welcome everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we have a lot of material to go through, so we'll go ahead and get started uh, so that we can have some time for questions afterwards. Uh, in addition, uh, ACP New York was good enough to send uh, five scenarios, which are mostly are covered in the talk, but a couple points are not. So we'll be sure and, and uh, touch on those before we leave. Um, the, I have no disclosures. All the verbiage on this slide and this slide are uh, from U at UCLA for the credit. Um, we're going to talk today about perioperative management of antithrombotics, and I'm presenting this from my own standpoint, which is that of a general internist slash hospitalist. Uh, I've staffed preoperative evaluation clinics here at the Mayo Clinic, and we have a very robust surgical practice. We have over 100 operating rooms, and so it's a busy, busy clinic. And I've uh, also staffed uh, hospital consultation services, which focus on perioperative medicine. We're going to go through four cases and talk about them and then uh, circle back and have a little more in-depth discussion on some of the actual uh, risk stratification guidelines from both the American College of Chest Physicians as well as the uh, ACC AHA. <clears throat> we'll talk about bridging, uh, reversing anticoagulants. We'll talk about antiplatelet drugs and starting post-op, restarting post-op. Now, you're going to see several copies of this slide this morning. Uh, these are the five things that you need to think about when you are asked to do a pre-op evaluation and make recommendations for any thrombotic management for any patient. So first, the question is, is there a need to interrupt at all? And there is not always. We'll talk about uh, specific cases where you don't need to interrupt the anticoagulant. Uh, if you are going to interrupt, though, what is the timing of that? pre-procedure, and that depends a lot on the drug and the patient's uh, renal status. Those are the two big items. Then there's the timing of post-procedure resumption. Uh, is there a need for bridging? And bridging is, uh, for, if you're not familiar with the term, is basically designed to minimize the time uh, that patients who are on warfarin, which is when bridging is used, it is not used for the DOAX, uh, but if they're on warfarin, you minimize the time that they're actually uh, having a subtherapeutic INR. And we'll talk about the mechanics of how that goes. And then we'll talk about how to reverse some of these drugs or all of the drugs, really. So let's start with the, the first case. Uh, you're asked to see a 76-year-old female who's going to have a total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy and you're seeing her preoperatively. She has stage one endometrial cancer. Uh, underlying, she has atrial fib, for which she takes metoprolol and warfarin, and she also has a history of an embolic CVA that uh, happened when the AFib was diagnosed. She has hypertension and hyperlipidemia as well. She takes metoprolol, warfarin, lisinopril, and hydrochlorothiazide. The lipids are managed with her diet. Um, her exam uh, really is not terribly surprising. She has an irregularly irregular pulse, blood pressure is a little borderline high, but really not much else going on. Her INR is therapeutic at 2.4, creatinine 1.2. Now we don't have an EGFR, but you, I think we can assume that her creatinine clearance is not as good as 1.2 in terms of the actual creatinine, just because of her age. Uh, it's you know, probably in the 30 to 40, maybe 50 range. Uh, her CBC and electrolytes are normal and her EKG corroborates the AFib, but no changes. So regarding her anticoagulation, you recommend what? Well, first, is there a need to interrupt? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, she's on warfarin, she's fully anticoagulated with a therapeutic INR, and she's going to have 
uh, you know, a major abdominal, abdominal pelvic operation. Uh, what about the pre-procedure timing, uh, stopping the drug? We'll talk about that and then how to resume it. Do we need to bridge this patient? Again, she's on warfarin. We have to risk stratify her. And then do we need to reverse her? Well, at this point, no, because you have enough time to deal with it. Her surgery is not, you know, tomorrow. So your choices are, one, stop the warfarin five days pre-op and begin again post-op with timing at the discretion of the surgeon. Uh, two, stop the warfarin five days pre-op and instruct her to start aspirin to be taken perioperatively. Three, stop the warfarin five days pre-op and then bridge with low molecular weight heparin beginning three days pre-op and starting 12 hours post-op. Four, stop, uh, four is the same thing as three, except that you restart 48 hours post-op. And five is to continue the warfarin through the perioperative period, but lower the INR goal to one and a half to two. Now, you guys are all muted, so I, I, and we don't have an audience response system, so we're just gonna go to the answer, which uh, the best answer, I think, which is number four. Um, the first one isn't good because this patient actually does need bridging, as we're going to talk about. Uh, the second one is not a good choice because aspirin is not a substitute for warfarin in AFib. Uh, the third one is not a good choice because you're restarting too soon after the operation. And the last one is not a good choice because she's not going to be covered uh, adequately in terms of anticoagulation. So stopping the warfarin five days pre-op bridging uh, beginning three days pre-op and then commencing 48 hours post-op, I think is the best choice here. Now, you will see several tables similar to this during the course of the talk this morning. Um, this one is dealing with uh, perioperative warfarin management in atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> you can substitute DOAX in here, but uh, as we'll talk about, we don't bridge with DOAX. So the main uh, emphasis is this patient's on warfarin. In all of the tables, uh, we have the risk of thromboembolism, which is defined as high, moderate, or low, and it's greater than 10%, five to 10, or less than 5%. Um, then we have the patient characteristics and then the recommendations regarding bridging. And these tables all are from the American College of Chest Physicians. So the patients who are at the highest risk have a CHADS-2 score of five to six. That would translate into a CHADS-2 VAS score of about seven to nine. Uh, or they can have a recent within three months stroke or TIA, uh, a CHADS score of less than five, but a history of stroke or TIA, uh, rheumatic valve liver disease, <clears throat> surgery with a high risk of VTE, or patients with a history of stroke that occurred when their warfarin was previously interrupted. So these are all the patients considered at high risk and those that you would certainly consider uh, bridging at least preoperatively. Uh, bridging postoperatively obviously incurs more risk of bleeding and you do have to be a little more cautious and, and have some conversations with the surgeons. But these are the patients preoperatively. Now our patient, if you recall, uh, if you add up her CHADS2 score, it's four. Uh, if she was a CHADS2 VASC score, it would be uh, six or seven if you give her a point for vascular disease, but at least six. However, she does have a history of a stroke. So it really doesn't matter what her CHADS score is if there is a history of a stroke. And I think that's the main piece of history that you need to get at in patients who have AFib <clears throat> and you're making recommendations about, because that trumps really pretty much everything else, assuming there is a rheumatic heart disease and so forth, uh, in terms of risk for uh, subsequent stroke uh, and thromboembolic events during the surgery. Moderate risk patients are patients with a lower CHAD score and no stroke history. You could bridge them. Uh, if there's a really high risk of procedure coming along, I wouldn't though, so high risk in terms of bleeding. And then the low risk patients are those with a, a, a chance score of zero to two and no risk of stroke, or, I'm sorry, no history of stroke or TIA, and they would not need to be bridged. So again, the main thing here is to get the history of a stroke or not, or a TIA uh, and calculate the CHAD score. So our second case is a 58-year-old man who has a prosthetic aortic valve. Uh, it is a St. Jude valve, which is a bileaflet valve placed three years ago for severe aortic stenosis. Uh, 
and he's going to have a cholecystectomy. So he is on a warfarin, uh, a torvastatin, and some occasional Tylenol. He has really no other past history, no cardiac history. He's not diabetic, not hypertensive, uh, nothing really else going on. Uh, his exam, again, is pretty much as you would expect. You, you should hear a outflow murmur and some pretty sharp valve sounds. Uh, but otherwise, there was not uh, really anything unexpected. His lab also looks good. His INR is uh, 2.6. Uh, CBC and electrolytes are normal. So what would we do for this gentleman? Again, do we need to interrupt? Yes, we do. There's a risk of bleeding with a cholecystectomy, laparoscopic or open. Um, how should we time the interruption? Do, how do we resume it afterwards? Is there a need for bridging? That's really the question here. And we need to do some risk stratification. And do we need to reverse it? We probably don't. So our choices here are to stop the warfarin five days before, start low, well, it's basically stop the warfarin bridge and then restart 48 hours post-op. The second choice is stop the warfarin and simply restart 24 hours post-op. So don't bridge. The third one is start, uh, stop the warfarin three days ahead and low molecular weight heparin uh, 12 hours post-op. Uh, the fourth is stop the warfarin five days before and begin uh, low molecular weight heparin 12 hours post-op until the INR is therapeutic. And the last one is stop it uh, five days before and put, start the patient on unfractionated uh, heparin uh, 5,000 sub-Q twice a day for three days, which is a prophylactic dose, not a therapeutic dose. So again, uh, we'll go to the answer. And in this case, uh, is really quite simple. We simply need to stop the warfarin and restart about 24 hours post-operatively. So how did we decide not to bridge this man? So this table looks at perioperative anticoagulation and particularly warfarin management in valve patients. So we have our high-risk patients. They have a, any mitral valve prosthesis. So any mitral valve, whether it's new, old, or in between. Uh, if they have an older form of an aortic valve prosthesis, so a cage ball or a tilting disc, none of these are not used anymore uh, at all. But it's plausible that you would encounter a, a quite elderly patient who may have one of these. Or if they've had a recent stroke and they define that as a six months or TIA. So these are the high risk patients and those should be bridged. Moderate risk would be five to 10% of uh, uh, per year of thromboembolism. These folks have a bileaflet valve, which is what our patient has, and one or more of the following risk factors. So AFib and then everything else on here are the CHADS criteria. So if they have any of these, they are considered at moderate risk. And you could consider bridging, although you wouldn't have to. And then the low risk patients have the newer valve, the bileaflet valve, no atrial fibrillation and no other risk factors. And that really is our patient. So there's no need to bridge him. We can simply stop the warfarin, have the surgery, and then restart the warfarin post-operative. So it's fairly simple in that case. Our third case is an 80-year-old female who's going to have an open reduction internal fixation for a left hip fracture. Now, <clears throat> that suggests that she's going to have the hip pin but very frequently there, it ends up being a hip replacement. Sometimes you know that ahead of time based on uh, some preoperative planning and CTs done by the orthopedist. Uh, and sometimes it's a decision made in the operating room. She has atrial fibrillation, hypertension, osteoporosis, stage two chronic kidney disease and type two diabetes. So a pretty typical elderly patient that you would see. She takes the Bigotran or Prodaxa 150 milligrams twice a day, metoprolol, hydrochlorothiazide, calcium, vitamin D, and metformin. Um, she's in the ER. She's a little bit in some pain. Her, uh, her pulse is you know, on the high side, not too bad. Blood pressure is up a little bit. A few rowels, soft mitral regurge murmur, and the left lower extremity is externally rotated. The EKG confirms the atrial fib, but there were really no acute changes. Electrolytes look good. Now the creatinine 1.6, which is consistent with her stage two CKD. I think if you had an EGFR in this patient, it would probably be in the 
between 2030 range, uh, maybe in the high 30s, which begs the question of whether she's on the right dose of dabigatran. One might consider the lower dose for the, that kind of renal function. But this is what she came in on, and she has some mild cardiomegaly. So do we need to interrupt? Yes, this is a major operation with potential for bleeding. What is the timing of the interruption? And what about resuming? Do we need to bridge? Uh, and how do we reverse this uh, drug? So these are your choices. And uh, this is a more complicated case. You can stop the dabigatran and proceed with surgery tomorrow and restart 12 hours post-op. Stop the uh, number two is stop the dabigatran and give uh, vitamin K and operate tomorrow. Number three, stop the dabigatran and ask for dialysis to remove the drug before proceeding to the OR. Number four, stop the dabigatran and delay surgery for 48 hours. Or number five, stop it and delay for three days. Now, this one actually, I think, has two reasonable choices, which are numbers four and five. Um, number one uh, is not a good choice because the dabigatran certainly will not be out of her system by tomorrow. And if you restart at 12 hours post-op, you're going to have the patient fully anticoagulated about 14 hours post-op, uh, which the surgeon may not want to have, uh, have done. Uh, vitamin K, and number two, has no effect on it. Uh, you can dialyze the drug. And before the antidote was available, that is how it was reversed. But that would be a rather extreme procedure to do in this setting. So I think stopping it and delaying longer, uh, two or three days, are the best answer. Now, this is a hip fracture, and you don't have weeks to delay the surgery. Uh, it is generally felt that within 20, 24 hours, within 24 hours is ideal. 48 to 72 is less ideal, but you know you want to get the surgery done because the risk of you know major post-op complications, stroke, DVT, PE goes quite high in the setting of delayed surgery. So let's talk about dabigatran a little bit. In general, uh, you need to hold three days or a minimum of a couple of days before procedures if the GFR is greater or equal to 50. So if they have pretty normal renal function, you have to hold it a couple of days, ideally three days. Uh, if the GFR is less than 50, then it's three to five days. And in some places, you'll see recommendations for up to seven days. Uh, bridging is not recommended for this or any of the other DOACs, which we will talk about. Uh, so you would not need to worry about bridging at all. Uh, you would generally restart no sooner than 24, uh, but probably around 48 hours post-op. You can talk to the surgeon and see how comfortable they are. And it depends on what procedure is done. Uh, but remember that the onset of the drug is within a couple of hours of taking the drug and that the patient is fully anticoagulated at that point. There is no buildup. And although you understand that clearly, the surgeon may or may not, and it's sometimes helpful to... Uh, remind them. This drug is now reversible. There's a humanized monoclonal antibody that's available. Uh, in addition, the bigotran of, the, of all the DOACs, and a DOAC is a direct oral anticoagulant, of all the DOACs, this is the only thrombin inhibitor. So you can measure the thrombin time and see how, uh, how active the drug is, essentially. So for example, in our case, if you wanted to see if you could operate safely after two days of holding the dabigatran, you could get a thrombin time. And if it is normal, then the drug is really not active and you can say, you should be able to safely operate. If it is not normal, then the drug still is interfering with the thrombin. Um, if it's an emergency procedure, it would be good to probably have the hematologist involved. Uh, but I don't think it would be any different recommendation other than using the reversing agent. And as you know, this drug is indicated for other things besides uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, what about the factor 10 inhibitors? And the two that are used primarily are apixaban, which is Eliquis, and rivaroxaban, which is Xeralto. Endoxaban is not used much and uh, has a lot of black box warnings. And it really is not caught on, and, and there's not much data on it. So I don't have particular information 
or specific information on endoxaban. Um, what I have, uh, and I frankly have never encountered it, but what I have read is that it can be treated somewhat like uh, rivaroxaban. So apixaban or Eliquis is widely used, as you know. It has a rapid onset. This drug does have a lot of liver metabolism and there is possible drug-drug interactions with uh, inducers, which can lower the drug levels. And you have to be cognizant of that when you prescribe it, uh, making sure that the patient isn't on other drugs and they perturb the uh, effectiveness of it. It's eliminated about 25% unchanged in the urine, but otherwise metabolized in the urine and feces. Uh, multiple indications, including prophylactic uh, uh, use with uh, orthopedic procedures. It does have an antidote. Um, the, it's a com competing recombinant inactive factor 10 antibody. It's a Nexonet Alpha. Uh, it's very expensive, as you can see. In general, uh, you need to stop this drug 24 to 48 hours pre-op. If there is renal insufficiency, you might want to even go to three days. Uh, but in general, one to two is good. And restarting is again, dependent a little bit on how comfortable the surgeon is having the patient fully anticoagulated after the first dose. Rivaroxaban, uh, again, short onset, uh, some hepatic uh, metabolism, but it's mostly just renally excreted. Uh, Half-life is, is noted there. Uh, renal function can affect that. Uh, multiple indications, same uh, antidote. And uh, again, at least 24 hours. If there's renal insufficiency, you would go to 48 and then restart post-op. So case four, uh, you're asked to see a 35-year-old female for a pre-op exam. She's going to have other gallbladder out too. At the age of 22, she developed a DBT while on oral uh, contraceptives. And the workup done then revealed that she had uh, antiphospholipid antibodies. So what's considered a major thrombophilia. She was started on lifelong warfarin and has had no subsequent thromboembolic problems. Her exam and vital signs are normal. The INR is 2.4. And you recommend for her, again, do we need to stop? Yes. Uh, what's the timing? And what's the timing for resumption? Do we need to bridge? We need to do some risk stratification and do we need to reverse? So your choices here are stop the warfarin for five days and resume post-op, so no bridging. Uh, the second one is hold the warfarin five days and begin uh, low molecular weight heparin at prophylactic doses, three days pre-op, resume 72 hours post-op. Uh, number three is place in uh, inter inferior vena cava filter. Hold the warfarin five days and resume post-op at the surgeon's discretion and then remove the filter electively. And the fourth one is uh, hold the warfarin, stop the therapy, or rather start therapeutic uh, low molecular weight heparin three days pre-op, resuming 24 hours post-op until the INR is therapeutic. So the best answer here is number four. Um, number five is not good because as we'll see, this patient does need to be bridged. Uh, the second one is not correct because we don't bridge with prophylactic doses. We bridge with therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin. The third one is incorrect because there is really no indication for an IVC filter. The only indication for an IVC filter is a patient who must be anticoagulated, but who cannot be safely anticoagulated. So this would be, for example, a patient who yesterday had a craniotomy, uh, so a very high risk bleeding situation, if there was to be bleeding, and today or tomorrow develops a DBT. So they really, they really should be anticoagulated, but you really can't safely do it. That's the kind of patient that you place an IVC filter in. So let's talk about perioperative management, particularly with warfarin for patients with a history of BTE. <clears throat> the highest risk patients are those that have had a DVT or PE within three months, or if they have a severe thrombophilia, and she does, they're listed here, and she has the antiphospholipid antibodies. Those patients should generally be bridged. <clears throat> Excuse me. The moderate risk patients <clears throat> have had a DVT or PE between three and 12 months. A non-severe 
uh, thrombophilia, the much more common heterozygous factor V Leiden uh, mutation and so forth, recurrent DVTs or PEs or an active cancer uh, treatment within six months. Those you would consider bridging, you wouldn't have to. And then the low risk would be uh, you know, a remote DVT or PE and no other risk factors, you would not bridge those. So Our Lady does have a major thrombophilia, so she does need to be bridged and uh, she should be able to proceed with that recommendation. So let's talk about patients who are on uh, warfarin, on a vitamin K antagonist. We stop five days before the procedure because it generally takes, if they're in a therapeutic range to begin with, if they're between two and three, uh, it generally takes five days for the INR to go down to one. It doesn't happen in every patient, so it's very prudent, I think, to check the INR the uh, one day pre-op. And if it's still a little bit high, let's just say it's you know 2.3 or four or something like that, um, you have the opportunity to reverse it with a small dose of oral vitamin K. It takes about 12 hours for that to work, uh, but that should bring it down uh, closer to one. Um, you could use a prothrombin complex, but that's really reserved more for urgent situations, as we'll talk about. Um, you can resume the warfarin, generally speaking, about 24 hours post-op, but you do need to discuss with the surgeon. It depends on uh, the procedure that was done, uh, what they encountered in the operating room, and the comfort of the surgeon. So this is something that needs to be discussed with them, and the surgeons are almost always writing the post-op orders. Um, <clears throat> as we talked about with our one case for mechanical valves, especially the mitral uh, valves and the older aortic valves, uh, as well as AFib, and again, risk factors, particularly the history of stroke, you need to be thinking about bridging. Um, if, the, if there is really no risk of DTE, such as our, our valve patient in our case, uh, you don't need to bridge. So as I said, bridging is intended to minimize the time the INR is subtherapeutic. Uh, we generally use low molecular weight heparin at a therapeutic dose. If the warfarin stopped five days pre-op, typically it is drifted down to around two, uh, about three days pre-op. And then that's the time when it's under two that you want to bridge. So you bridge on day three and day four, uh, pre-op, and then you stop at 24 hours pre-op. If you're using unfractionated heparin, IV, for example, the patient's in the hospital for something else, uh, then you would stop the heparin uh, about six hours pre-op. You can resume, again, uh, depending on the risk of bleeding and the uh, surgeon and so forth, generally, uh, Oh, I'd even say 24, but 48 to 72 hours afterwards. Uh, but you do need to individualize it. You can assess the bleeding risk of the patient using the has bled score with uh, greater than three being at high risk. And I've listed the uh, components of has bled, hypertension, abnormal liver, renal function, stroke, actively bleeding, uh, labile INR, elderly defined as 65, and if they have drug use or alcohol use. And bridging is not done for DOEX. And the reason it's not done for DOEX is that we really don't have any good idea of how these drugs decay, and there's really no good way to measure it either. Now, bridging used to be done a lot more often than it is now. Uh, the bridge trial, however, came along a few years ago and threw an awfully lot of cold water on the enthusiasm for good reason, I think. Uh, now, and I'll go through this in some detail. It was a, a randomized controlled trial, double blind, placebo controlled. All patients had AFib. They, it was criticized, however, because the CHAD score, the mean CHAD score was three to four. This was CHADS2, not CHADS2-VASC. Um, so by definition, those patients rarely had a history of stroke. So they were kind of in the low risk category. Um, the warfarin was stopped appropriately five days before. They used daltaparin. Uh, they resumed the warfarin 24 hours, and they continued the daltaparin until the uh, until the warfarin was therapeutic. And it was a high risk procedure. They began it a little later, low risk, sooner. 
But they found that uh, thromboembolism, uh, whether you bridged or not, was about the same incidence, 0.4 and 0.3%, and bleeding was higher, 1.3%, uh, I'm sorry, 3.2% in the bridge group versus 1.3% in the no bridge group. So people said, well, we shouldn't be bridging so much. And I think that's true. But again, we're talking about patients with a lower risk of stroke. And that's why it's so very important to have that piece of history when you make a decision. This is uh, another study, and there are a lot of other studies, uh, not randomized, these are retrospective, but they basically corroborated the same thing. Uh, in this particular study that was done at Kaiser, uh, relevant bleeding was 2.7% in the bridge group, 0.2% in the no bridge group, and no difference in VTE. So consider the bleeding risk. Uh, if they have high or moderate condi risk conditions, uh, you do need to think about bridging. We talked about a VTE less than three months ago, an active malignancy, a recent stroke, and the thrombophilias, as well as the mechanical valves in particular positions. We'll go through this because we've covered it. Now let's shift gears a little bit because a lot of patients are on antiplatelet drugs as well. Um, and primarily for having had cardiac stents placed. So if aspirin or clopidogrel, and I'm using clopidogrel to include all the other, the ticagrelor and the other drugs, <clears throat> are to be stopped is generally seven to 10 days before the procedure and resumed about 24 hours post-op if possible. But it does depend on whether or not there's a bare metal stent when it was placed or a drug eluting stent and when it was placed. So for bare metal stents, the surgery, elective surgery should be deferred for a month if possible. Uh, if you can, if the surgeon will allow it, you should continue both drugs if you're in that time frame and you have to have the surgery done. So let's say, you know, it's an emergency or it's a hip fracture or something like that. Now, if the surgeon simply won't operate on that, then you would continue the aspirin only. You'd stop the clopidogrel. However, in those situations, you don't usually have seven to 10 days to stop it. So you'd hold it and see what happens. If it's a drug eluting stent, you need to defer elective procedures for between three and six months. We'll define that a little bit more. If possible, continue the aspirin and clopidogrel. If the procedure is within six months of stent placement, if they want to operate on both, continue the aspirin. Um, and we don't generally bridge antiplatelet drugs. Now, this is a graphic which basically tells you the same thing from the uh, most recent ACC AHS guidelines. So at the top, we have the patients treated with a percutaneous intervention undergoing elective non-cardiac surgery. So bare metal stent treated with dual uh, antiplatelet therapy. Uh, less than 30 days since the bare metal stent, you really don't want to operate unless you absolutely have to. Over 30 days, you should be able to proceed hopefully continuing both drugs, but at least continuing the aspirin. And as you know, from the standpoint of stents, the patients are on both drugs at least for a year, unless it was a play, unless the stent was placed in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, in which case they may be on both drugs forever. Or if they're being followed post-stroke, they may be on both drugs forever. Um, in this situation though, very often the surgeons don't wanna operate on both drugs or with both drugs. Uh, so if you can at least continue the aspirin, that's uh, a compromise that I think is acceptable. For drug eluting stents, <clears throat> we get the red light all the way out to three months. Three to six months proceed if you have to. And after six months, it should be quite safe to do. What about other procedures? Dental. Um, dental procedures usually can be done without any interruption. Uh, not all the dentists are crazy about this, but certainly a cleaning, a uh, single extraction, uh, or maybe two teeth, I think you could do. If you're extracting all the teeth in preparation for dentures or something like that, I probably would hold the anticoagulants. Um, if they're having implants, I probably would hold them as well, because there's a little more risk of bleeding. Then dermatologic procedures are the same. You generally don't need to hold at all. 
Uh, the exclusion though is the MOAS procedure because that can get quite extensive and, and involve a fair amount of bleeding. Uh, how about ophthalmology? Cataracts do not require the cessation of anticoagulants, aspirin, clopidogrel, warfarin, or endoac. Uh, there are many ophthalmologists who will not operate on patients with cataracts that are on these drugs, but it really is quite safe to do. Um, our uh, protocol is to continue the anticoagulants for, for cataract surgery. Now, other eye surgery is a different story, particularly if there's going to be retinal procedure uh, where there can be bleeding and where it can be much more damaging situations. So you would hold them for uh, other ophthalmologic procedures. And one of the cases that I uh, was given addresses that. How about reversing these drugs? So if it's a VKA, a vitamin K drug, or, and we'll talk a little bit about thrombocytopenia, if there's no platelets, what do we do? So uh, you can reverse vitamin K dependent uh, anticoagulants, warfarin, with vitamin K. Uh, you can give it actually by any route. Uh, if it's urgent, you can give it IV. There's a very low risk of anaphylaxis. Uh, it can be given sub Q, it can be given IM, or it can be given PO. It is absorbed more slowly PO. So if you want it to work faster, I'd give it parenterally somewhere or the other, but it still takes a little while to act. Uh, historically, we have reversed uh, warfarin with fresh frozen plasma, which does work. It simply replaces the uh, clotting factors that are interfered with. The problem with it is it's pretty high volume and uh, you may have to give multiple units. So I think the preferred method now, if you have to urgently reverse warfarin, is to use a prothrombin complex concentrate with four components. Uh, you may need to consult hematology to help you with it. It's quite costly to do, but it's less volume for the patient than fresh frozen plasma. It does carry a small thrombotic risk, but it works quite well in a matter of hours. Now, how about the patient who has low platelets? Uh, we try to have the platelet count at least 50,000 for any procedure. And if it's a spine procedure or a craniotomy, you know, central nervous system procedure, uh, we'd like it at 100,000. So you have a patient with a platelet count of 20,000, we'll say. Um, you will need to know how many units of platelets to give them pre-op and how many units the anesthesiologist may want to have available, available intraoperatively. And it's pretty hard to estimate that. So uh, what our hematologists recommend is that you, a few days pre-op, give the patient one unit of platelets and see how much impact that has. So you get a baseline count is 20,000, you give them one unit of platelets, it's 40,000. So that tells you pre-op, you should probably give them at least two units of platelets and maybe have a couple available in the operating room as well. Uh, if it doesn't bump up that much, then you may have to go higher. Now, if the patient's thrombocytopenia is an autoimmune thrombocytopenia, the autoantibodies are going to destroy the transfused platelets just as they do the intrinsic platelets. So the effect of the transfusion is going, it can be quite brief. And those patients, you may want to have more uh, intraoperative platelet packs available than you would for someone with a splenomegaly. How about reversing the bigotram? Um, Praxabind, I can't pronounce the generic name of this drug, is available. It's given as IV boluses, uh, two and a half milligram is 15 minutes apart, works pretty fast in four hours. You don't have to adjust the dose. It has some adverse effects. Uh, there may be some clotting. Uh, and it's fairly expensive for about $5,000 a dose, but it is uh, available and it can be used. Um, this has eliminated the need to dialyze uh, the bigotran away. Uh, what about the factor 10 inhibitors? Uh, so the apixaban, rivaroxaban, and doxaban. Uh, and, uh, and dexanet alpha uh, works on all of them. It's actually been approved for life-threatening bleeds, mainly for apixaban or rivaroxaban. Uh, it actually acts as a decoy. Uh, it's, a, it's a form of factor 10 that doesn't work, but it, it attracts the drug and ties up the drug so that the intrinsic factor 10 can work. Uh, it does have some clotting risk uh, and a fairly high risk of death. Now, it's not death from the drug, it's just death within 30 days. 
um, it's, it's, uh, that may be a little misleading. The patients who are receiving this drug are in pretty dire straits to begin with. So if, you're, if you have somebody who uh, is needing to have their uh, factor 10 inhibitor reversed for an emergency operation, an emergency is defined as needing to be in the OR within six hours to correct the problem that you're operating for, or they would die um, or lose a limb. It's either loss of limb or life. <clears throat> They're quite sick. So this is the patient who uh, has a, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, for example. Uh, they have a very high risk of death anyway. So whether this is related to the, the drug in any way or not, I think is speculative. Uh, there's no data for pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Uh, you can monitor factor 10 levels, uh, particularly you could use trauma levels, but factor 10 is preferred. The problem is those are not readily available. They're not even done every day in every lab. And so it's not something that you can easily monitor. Um, it is very costly, up to 50 some thousand dollars per dose. You do also uh, adjust the dose depending on the timing of the last dose of the factor 10 inhibitor. So if you have a patient who took their Eliquis this morning and this afternoon and you need to reverse them, you're going to need a higher dose than if they took the Eliquis yesterday. So the final considerations, is there a need to interrupt? You need to risk stratify. Think of those tables. Uh, do we need to interrupt it? And uh, how are we going to interrupt it? Uh, Pre-procedural timing varies with the agent and the renal status of the patient. Uh, timing of the resumption, you again, risk stratify. If they're at very high risk, you may want to consider some post-op bridging, but you need to discuss with the surgeon and see how comfortable they are. It's not uncommon that postoperatively, instead of doing full bridging with therapeutic heparin, for example, uh, that the surgeon will comp compromise and allow us to use uh, prophylactic dose. Now, there's no data on whether that really works. It doesn't seem to increase bleeding, but that may be the compromise or do nothing. Uh, need for bridging is mainly for warfarin. Uh, particularly if there's a previous stroke or major thrombo thrombophilia, recent DVT, uh, you do not need to bridge the DOAX and then how to reverse if you need to. So that is the uh, main part of the talk. I do want to touch on these cases and I think we have a few minutes to do that. I'll go through them very quickly and then there should be some time. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna take the slides down here. So the first case that I was given uh, is a 67-year-old female who has AFib, DVT, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease. She's scheduled for an epidural uh, for back pain, and she takes Eliquis, uh, and she's referred uh, for you know, management of that. So I have a couple of questions about this. Number one is, you know, if, we look, if we think about our table on previous DVT is when did she have the DVT? If it was within three months, I would defer the uh, thing altogether until it's beyond three months. But if it's a remote DVT, we should be able to proceed. The second thing is, I don't know what her renal status is. It just says CKD. If it's stage you know, three, four, uh, we would need to delay longer. She's on Eliquis, so you don't need to bridge her. Uh, there are recommendations from the American Society of uh, Anesthesiology about epidurals, and they in general recommend stopping the DOAX three days ahead of time and not restarting until six hours after the catheter is removed. Uh, so that's how I would probably manage this patient, particularly if she has some CKD. If the patient were on warfarin, you would stop the warfarin five days ahead. Um, the second patient has a stents, uh, cardiac stents and is on aspirin and Plavix and is going to have retinal surgery. Um, so this, in this situation, there is some risk of bleeding and certainly more than a cataract. Uh, you would need to discuss with the ophthalmologist. Um, if possible, I would continue the aspirin, but just continue the uh, Plavix a week to 10 days ahead of time. Uh, the third patient is a 54-year-old male, diabetes, AFib, uh, is going to have a dental cleaning extraction and then implant, and is on Coumadin. So you need to risk stratify, is there any need to bridge or not? Um, 
for the cleaning and for the extraction, if it's just, as I said, one tooth or a couple of teeth, you probably don't need to stop anything. Um, if it's the whole you know, lower bridge, uh, you would, uh, and then restart post-op. And I think the implants, you would, you would need to alter the, uh, you'd need to hold the incumbent. The fourth patient is going to have a screening colonoscopy. Uh, AFib and is on warfarin INR 2.5. And the question is, what are the risks of bleeding for removal of polyps and how should the anticoagulants be managed? Well, a couple of things. Um, screening versus diagnostic colonoscopies, in my mind, are the same thing. Because if you're doing a screening colonoscopy and you encounter a polyp, you're going to remove it. You're not going to reprep the patient. So I think they should be treated as the same. I wouldn't distinguish. Um, if the polyp is less than one centimeter, the bleeding risk is not that high. If it's over one centimeter, it is high. We don't know how big they are, <laughs> generally speaking. Sometimes you do, but not usually before the colonoscopy. So I think you need to look at this as a relatively, a potentially high bleeding risk situation. So you wouldn't treat this any differently than anybody else. You would decide if the patient needed to be bridged pre-op, if, if this patient's on warfarin, based on their risk assessment and so forth. Otherwise, just stop it five days ahead. And then you would need to talk to the uh, gastroenterologist about restarting. Uh, they generally like to wait a couple of days, three or four days before restarting. Uh, I shouldn't say three or four, two or three days, uh, but it should be uh, safe to do it that way. But you, I think the main thing here is not to try and distinguish between screening and diagnostic. And the last patient has a history of 68-year-old male, AFib, previous stroke, uh, aspirin, and on Eliquis, and is scheduled for a, now they've said, same-day procedure on his, on his knee. Now, I'm reading that to mean it's going to be done today. The day you see the patient is when the surgery is going to be done or the procedure is going to be done. So the patient's on Eliquis, and uh, you would need to hold that for a um, couple of days at least. Uh, depending on their renal function, which we don't know. And so I think you need to talk to the surgeon and put this onto a little different schedule and you know, realign it. But, but I would not uh, recommend that he go to the operating room today on the eloquence. I, I, one other word about this, each of these scenarios stated that you were asked to clear the patient for surgery. And I am going to recommend that that is not the right terminology to use. Um, you, the only people who really ultimately decide if a patient's going to go to the OR or not uh, is the anesthesiologist, or it could be put to sleep or not, I should say. Um, your job is to actually do a consult, and you're being asked by the surgeon, generally speaking, the audience of the consult, besides the patient, is the surgeon and the anesthesiologist and you need to make some recommendations. So I think it's better to say, um, you know, this patient has been optimized medically with the following recommendations for the planned procedure, rather than saying, I'm clearing the patient for surgery, go ahead. Uh, if something, if anything goes awry in the operating room and there ends up being you know, legal action taken, you have dug yourself a hole. Uh, so I would avoid that word. So with that, I think we have a lot of questions here. Um, Kristen, you would just want me to take these in order or what? I have them written down. Actually, a lot of that is me uh, reaching out to the panelists. But just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, section and I'll read them to Dr. Lohr. Or if you'd like to speak with him directly, just raise your hand. In the meantime, one of the questions, Dr. Lohr, was, for patients with osteoporosis needing dental procedures like implants, what is the recommendation? Dentists are often quite reluctant to perform procedures on these patients. Yeah, I think, uh, as I said, I think with implants and they're anticoagulated, I would hold the anticoagulation uh, for a cleaning, for a single extraction, you should be able to proceed. Okay. In this scenario of a patient with recent cardiac stent placement less than nine months needing a prostate biopsy on dag, dag, dag what would the recommendation sorry what would the recommendation be in view of the dangers of interrupting anticoagulation at this time so the uh, stent was how long ago six months nine months nine months 
So nine months, uh, if it's a drug eluting scent or a bare metal scent, uh, you should be able to proceed. Um, I would again, try to uh, continue the aspirin. If the urologist does not want to have him on Plavix, that's fine, uh, but I would try and at least continue the aspirin. Uh, but if they're beyond six months with a drug eluting stent, you should, you're in pretty safe territory to hold one of them anyway. Okay. The other question that was posted in the chat, you already answered. So if anybody has any other questions, please let us know. We'll hang out for a minute. Um, there are a few while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, names that you could just kind of at the end, if you're online with um, a different name than what you registered with, if you could just send that through the chat so I can make sure you get attendance for today, that would be great. Mm -hmm. But um, let me just make sure there's no other questions. Um, okay. I'm just looking at the chat things here. I don't. It's a lot of me in there. There's a lot of you in there, yeah. There, um, somebody commented, and I'm not sure if it's a question, just a statement. In regards to how long to delay a DOAC prior to surgery, input from the anesthesiologist might indicate a longer interval if a neuroxyl anesthetic is determined to be the best option for the patient. That's true. Uh, and, I, and I referenced that in the uh, one case here that the anesthesiologist typically, uh, assuming normal, relatively normal renal function, uh, generally for a DOAC would want three days, uh, holding the drug three days before the uh, procedure is done, before the neuraxial anesthetic is used. And then you would continue holding it until at least six hours after the catheter is removed. Now, if the renal function is not normal, and it does depend a little bit on which drug is being used. It may be more than three days ahead of time. Uh, but I think uh, everyone will find that the specialty society recommendations about these drugs are more aggressive in holding longer periods of time than the, the drug makers are. Uh, and it, I suspect they're speaking from the standpoint of, you know, I've had experience doing the procedure and we've had trouble and so forth. So. I think the uh, recommendations for many specialty societies are a little more aggressive than the drug makers. You'll have to decide which to use, um, but in general, you may end up holding the drug a little bit longer. So, so uh, Jim Bird uh, is going to talk, I'm gonna unmute him right now. So Jim, when you're ready, go ahead. Oh. Thank you, I just wanted to say that was an excellent talk, Dr. Lowe, really appreciate it. And I was just gonna to speak to the comment from the standpoint of as an, as an anesthesiologist. Yeah, Jim uh, is an anesthesiologist. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and as he knows, a perioperative medicine specialist, that, that um, in terms of holding the DOAC, sometimes, sometimes a, a longer period is required. And because some of our specialty organizations have more aggressively requested a longer time period for holding up to five days for some of the mm -hmm. DOACs. From a medical legal standpoint, it kind of forces you to move more in that direction, even if the evidence would state that, you know, three days might be adequate, for, you, know, you know, in regards to the half-life of the particular drug. But if the, if the American Society of Regional Anesthesia or Safety says you really need to delay five days, I would say most of my colleagues are gonna to wanna to probably delay five days as long as it doesn't put the patient at any significant undue risk for, for waiting. That, that was my main point. I, I agree with that 100% and, and uh, I'm glad you chipped in. I also wanna mention that Jim is on the West Coast where it's really early in the morning. So. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you for getting up. <laughs> All right. I guess this is the last call for uh, questions. Anybody else have one? All right. Well, I appreciate uh, your spending some time this morning. Hopefully this was uh, helpful for everyone. And uh, again, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lar. Okay, bye-bye.